Hola amigos, my name is Ushin Nani and I am thrilled to be your host here on stage two at Big Things Conference 2021. We have assembled a power trio of speakers for you this morning of sessions that are going to supercharge your life and your career in this exponential world using AI, using big data and even using space travel. So this conference is called Tech Awakening. Yes, and we have been through the pandemic. We've been through the lockdown and now we are all waking up to build a better future by using technology. But before we meet our legendary speakers today, I want to share with you how to have a little fun while you're watching our speakers and maybe win some awesome prizes as well. Now, all of you will be able to participate in our digital treasure hunt at Big Things Conference 2021. You already have received 25 big points just by logging in. So you're ahead of the game already. So what you do is just select the gamification options on the homepage or on the menu. I'll stay on the screen in a little video window and you can find out how to participate in our fantastic gamification to win those beautiful prizes. So you can see all the different options on the gamification uh, page about how you can win prizes, even a brand new iPhone 13, books, vouchers, lots of cool stuff. You've already got those 25 big points just by logging in. You can get another 25 big points by networking. And you know, some of these connections attending Big Things Conference 21 could change your life and change your career. So don't be shy, get involved, and you're going to win points as well. You can get 50 big points by applying for some of the amazing job offers that are available via our website. And you can get a smashing 100 big points by completing our quiz. And there's loads more, as you will see on our gamification page. For example, you can go for gold by visiting our sponsors in the special area on our website. You can get up to 240 points by attending our talks. And you can get an extra 50 big points by completing our Enigma sentence. Now, what is the Enigma sentence? Well, I'm glad you asked. There is a clue waiting for you during all of our four keynote presentations from Africa, Richard, Oscar, and Jason. So just tune in to the keynote presentations and a secret message will appear to help you crack the code of our Enigma sentence. So good luck. And if you do win that beautiful brand new iPhone 13, be sure to take a nice selfie and share it using the event hashtag, which is BigTH21. And just feel free to share the love at any time. If any of our speakers say something that resonates with you, if you think it's valuable, please share it on any social media channel using the hashtag BigTH21. And of course, you're very welcome to share screen grabs and videos of all of our speakers and MCs, but extra filters for me, por favor. And uh, I hope to see you there. I'll be involved as well. Okay, so let's crack on with our amazing schedule for this morning. Our first rock star speaker is Emmeline Pat Dalstrom, who is the CEO and co-founder at Space Base Limited. Emmeline is going to take you on a journey to outer space by leveraging data, AI, and investor insights. It's going to be an incredible presentation. I'm so happy she's able to join us live from New Zealand. So listen, don't forget to share your quotes from Emmeline using the event hashtag BigTH21 and get your questions into the chat window. If we have time with Emmeline, we will ask her the questions in real time. And that goes for all of our speakers. Get your questions in early so we can get to them all at the end if we possibly can. OK, Emmeline, welcome to Big Things Conference 21. The stage is yours. Hola, um, greetings from New Zealand. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, I'm Emmeline Pat Dahlstrom, and uh, thank you so much for uh, Big Things Conference for uh, basically uh, inviting me to present to you the future of the global space industry in an exponential world. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm Emily Pat Dalsum, originally from the Philippines, moved around to uh, uh, Europe and Canada before immigrating to the US about 25 years ago. My background's in physics and space science, but really worked a lot more on program development operations and uh, educational management um, in different areas, working for space startup companies like Space Adventures, all the way to uh, International Space University. Um, and then I maintain my global network uh, as well from Singularity University to the NASA Frontier Development Lab. Um, I came to New Zealand about four years ago and uh, basically focused on the democratization of 
access to space by uh, incorporating a social enterprise called Space Space. And our focus is to basically um, catalyze space ecosystems in developing and emerging countries through education, entrepreneurship, uh, and community building. And so what we do, uh, we basically, we, um, we uh, present and uh, give uh, educational programs, training workshops to adjacent industries. Uh, we also do innovation through challenge competitions, uh, mentorship, um, as well as ecosystem uh, building uh, as well. And then uh, the third part through our consulting service, uh, we also do business attraction. Uh, we um, help with strategy for local and national government, um, as, te as well as te technical due diligence for uh, investor companies. So uh, in this particular presentation, um, I guess I want to first uh, say that uh, as a disclaimer, I'm not an AI and a computing expert, uh, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to look at the sort of like the space industry trends as it uh, relate to AI computing, uh, big data, as well as robotics. So first to say is that the, you know, the definition of the space industry has changed over uh, kind of like the last decade is no longer just rockets and rocket ships. Uh, the, the definition now is really the whole supply chain, uh, not just like uh, uh, the big missions or the, la the launch companies, but actually uh, all that supply chain from every analog of a terrestrial industry has actually an, an analog in space. So within the last few years, as you can see, there's just so many things that have happened, uh, you know, from reusable rockets, 3D printed rockets, uh, manufacturing in space, there's commercial um, uh, activities with commercial crews, and then people uh, basically even nonprofit organizations like trying to land in the moon. And we think that this is actually happening uh, because of exponential technologies. You know, over the past, uh, just this past uh, decade, you know, we all know about Moore's Law and that certainty of how technology has been developing in an exponential uh, scale. Uh, and this has certainly um, influence a lot the development of the space industry, you know, for computing, nanotech, AI and robotics, um, and, and biotech. And uh, a case in point, if we think about the Apollo, um, you know, program back in the 60s, if you actually put together all of the computers um, that were used during that program, you look at your iPhone today, your iPhone, just one, is about 240 times much faster uh, than all of those NASA co computers combined, which is really interesting, which means that the iPhone is, is a supercomputer um, into, uh, in uh, you know, past terms. The other thing as well that uh, exponential technologies have done is that it has dematerialized the space industry. So um, even just a few years ago, when I compare satellites, it's like bus-sized uh, satellites have now become like shoe-sized shoe, uh, uh, or shoebox-sized satellites. And then today, um, it, it's actually the, uh, the comparison between a pocket sat to a chip sat. Um, exponential technologies have also demonetized the industry. So today you can go online, basically uh, you know, order the components of your satellite. And there are companies like Endurosat in Bulgaria who can uh, configure it and, and, and basically deliver the, the satellite bus in five days. And so today, um, that democratization has basically meant that uh, it used to be satellite imagery is very expensive. It also means that satellite uh, data analysis products are very expensive. But today, this has now become open, open source. Uh, governments have given uh, data for free. And then also, we've got open source softwares like QGIS. So essentially, all you need is a computer and Wi-Fi uh, to be able to be part of the space industry. So um, because of that, now uh, the space industry is no longer the realm of governments and uh, big aerospace companies. You've got like uh, three guys in a garage um, actually working to become um, you know, space companies. So this is one example with Planet back in Cupertino like 10 years ago. I don't know if you can actually uh, see the, the satellite there on the table, uh, but these guys now after 10 years um, dominate the uh, Earth observation uh, satellite market. Um, and they can uh, now uh, basically image 
uh, the world every 10, 30 in the morning, um, any day, uh, 365 uh, days of the year. So let's look at the, the basically the global uh, space industry for a second here. Uh, this is uh, where we are about uh, a, a year ago. The, the global space economy is rated to be $366 billion. Um, and with a prediction that uh, by 2040, uh, conservatively, it would be 1.1 trillion. Uh, but the, th the interesting thing here is that, uh, you know, always in the news is launchers and, and, and rockets, but that's just like 5 billion of kind of like the main uh, pie. Uh, and, and also there's the misnomer that like the space industry is largely uh, government uh, run, but that's only like 25% of, of the uh, kind of like the global uh, economy. But if so, if you actually look at the it, the seventy five percent is really the satellite industry, um, and that uh, has propelled also that exponential growth of launches that has been happening over the past like ten years. This has also created a small satellite launch market, uh, which is valued uh, to be six two billion dollars by twenty thirty. And today, there's only Rocket Lab and uh, uh, Virgin Orbit, uh, and, and also another like uh, Chinese uh, startup company that has been successful. There's about 150 con companies that are trying to be uh, like Rocket Lab right now. Most of that would be vaporware, but it's certainly an up and, uh, and, and coming uh, niche market. So one way to sort of like look at the space industry is through the upstream and downstream uh, side of the of the market. But what I'm going to actually do today is I'm going to segment it in two ways. One is the the trend of activities that are happening in low Earth orbit, um, and then uh, the second part will be kind of anything that is kind of beyond Earth orbit. So. Uh, one of the things that, that we take for granted with the space uh, industry today is that it really is the eyes of humanity's biggest problems. Uh, I like this quote from the VP of Planet that's saying, you know, you can't fix what you can't see. Uh, most of the Earth observing satellites have been put up by governments in past decades, but now commercial companies are beginning uh, to actually dominate th this uh, as well in a big way. And look at and let's look at some of the examples. Um, oh, but before that, uh, it's also great to um, to see that the progression between kind of like the size of satellites as well as the number of satellites that have been put up, uh, as well as the the kind of like the the uh, the bits and data information uh, that is being downloaded since the 1960s. Um, as, as you can see here, and then of course today we have over 130 uh, Earth observing satellites with 36 pe petabytes of data uh, that is uh, being extracted um, every year. So uh, as I mentioned, um, the, essentially there's a lot of applications uh, for satellite technology, but really today the planet is in a, is in a crisis. We all know that um, uh, climate change is is actually be, is uh, man-made, and there's so there's so much uh, information on monitoring. Uh, all of this uh, uh, really uh, like from disasters that are happening today. So here's like some of the examples um, that we're kind of like monitoring uh, using a lot of the techniques uh, that are being used today. So like, for example, with flood forecasting, uh, ma machine learning is being used uh, to potentially um, kind of create better and accurate flood maps um, and data fusion is also being used as well, using different sources from different satellites uh, to potentially uh, make these predictions better. Um, another uh, thing is, the, uh, for example, wildfires. Prior to COVID, uh, wildfires have devastated California and, and Australia. And today, uh, basically, uh, there's a collaboration between data scientists and AI um, experts uh, to uh, essentially create algorithms that can better detect um, and then also uh, uh, understand the fuel assessments as well as the fire behaviors uh, for uh, this uh, particular phenomena. Today, we can also see deforestation happening on a global scale uh, because of companies like Planet. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they can actually image 24 seven. 
Um, and this has basically given us a better understanding of how uh, basically deforestation is contributing uh, to, to climate change. Another uh, program that uh, also leverages uh, planet data is the Allen Coral Atlas. Uh, so today also with machine learning, they've managed to map sort of uh, all of the coral reefs around the world. And they can also now predict uh, as well bleaching, which of course um, is a, a big indicator for ocean acidification um, and ocean warming. Uh, today here in New Zealand, uh, we are actually leveraging both planet and the Allen Coral Atlas uh, to do a space for planet Earth challenge. Uh, we're looking at carbon sequestration and coral health. Um, today, we, are, we basically know a lot more about forest sequestration uh, as well as soil sequestration, but uh, areas like you know seagrass to mangroves, um, phytoplankton uh, blooms are also like areas that can sequester carbon that uh, are pretty much untapped and are still uh, being looked at uh, today by data scientists. And the last um, example here um, in this section is, is also that machine learning are, are helping um, to uh, detect lightning and cloud plumes much better using uh, geo satellites uh, as well and making sure that the you know we can have the false alarms that are being produced through kind of like uh, traditional uh, methods so another sort of like section of uh, satellite applications is planet management and so for example um in the agriculture business like precision agriculture for sure using and leveraging satellite data to monitor you know health of crops uh, certainly um you know given the uh, farmers like you know ten, potentially like 10% of increase in yield as well as 10% reduction in, in in pollution um by leveraging this this data Today, we monitor fishing uh, as well through satellite uh, companies like uh, Spire Global. Um, and this has given us insight as well to uh, maritime and, and shipping uh, management as well. Um, with these techniques uh, today, we know that at least 30% of uh, the fishing uh, activities are illegal. Um, and um, you know, just statistics wise, uh, the satellite programs have found like 4,200 illegal ships, um, which could be an estimated of like 100,000 workers which are held in slavery today, which is something that you'd think would uh, not be happening in today's um, modern world. Here's another uh, example with solar uh, weather. Um, most of the time we think about solar weather when we're thinking of you know just viewing auroras, but actually solar weather prediction um, is very vital, uh, especially because solar weather can actually do, uh, you know, damage on a global scale. It can knock out satellites, power grids, and internet trunk, trunk lines. And so better prediction uh, certainly uh, is needed um, uh, for this to prevent like some catastrophic storms. Um, in terms of communications, you know, we've had communication satellites for a while, but uh, the new constellations that are coming up with Wi-Fi on demand, like Starlink. So actually, on the side, I'm using Starlink uh, right now to uh, to do this uh, uh, Zoom presentation. Uh, this is a game changer for the the other like three billion um, in the world who basically do not have access to Wi-Fi. And just imagine the um, you know the implications of, of this to education and uh, to areas that are in remote areas. Now, while this is a positive, uh, of course, for um, for these areas, uh, the flip side to this is, of course, space to do with all of the the satellites that we've been launching. Uh, there's, of course, uh, the uh, the potential for overcrowding and then also the increase of potential space debris. So today, um, the US DOD is already tracking almost 30,000 pieces of orbital debris. Um, that's about the, those that are uh, bigger than like 10 centimeters. Uh, Leo Labs uh, now, which is a, co which is a, com a commercial company, uh, can now also track about 250,000 pieces uh, that are up to like two centimeters in size, but there's still almost a million objects 
that are not tracked uh, right now um, that could certainly uh, and have potential damage to like satellites uh, and, and even, even uh, you know, astronauts either on spacewalks or, or life on space station. And then actually today the, the ISS is doing a maneuver um, to uh, basically um, prevent the, a collision with a space debris. On a solar system scale, which is very similar, we're also tracking near-Earth objects. So now near-Earth objects are like asteroids that um, are on the same uh, kind of like orbital plane as, as the Earth. So, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, the dinosaurs uh, before do not have uh, in terms of, of uh, predicting um, uh, this potential kind of like city killer uh, uh, scale asteroids, um, but today we're tracking um, about almost 30,000 uh, NEOs. Back in the 70s, we only knew of 12, and every week uh, there's more that's being discovered. Um, the tracking is not uh, uh, really complete, but once the Rubin Observatory Large Synoptic Survey Telescope comes on board, uh, it's expected to discover like a, a hundred thousand NEOs more. Um, but also the implications of this is that because of its very sophisticated um, uh, system, uh, it's actually bringing down about 20 terabytes of data kind of like every night. So you just like see how how big uh, the data that's coming down. So um, with that, uh, we know we talked about the satellite remote sensing and data analysis applications. There's for sure challenges and opportunities, which uh, I kind of like alluded to. So for one, big data is going to be a big uh, sort of issue with all of the the launches and satellites and more sophisticated uh, satellites and launches. Um, Today, you know, we 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 basically um, from Earth observing uh, satellites, uh, we're we're generating about a hundred terabytes uh, per day, um, and that's going to be even be, get bigger in the future. So, once we have more and more bigger data, a challenge of transmitting that data from space back down to Earth uh, is also going to be um, an issue. So with traditional radio communications, as an example, it takes about 30 minutes uh, to get an image from Mars, uh, which is like two megabits per second. Uh, today, there are now laser communications uh, that is being developed uh, to increase sort of like uh, that, that uh, data um, transmission. Uh, but we certainly are going to need um, these uh, systems to deal with uh, those satellites that are getting more sophisticated and are, are, are have are more data. As part of that, data storage is also a challenge. Um, and today, most of the commercial space companies are actually um, doing commute, computing in the cloud and, and making um, uh, use of uh, cloud computing through AWS or Google Cloud uh, as well. And this is becoming a, a big uh, issue uh, today. Now, the flip side of that is instead of bringing down the data, uh, there's also development in onboard uh, processing where because of exponential technologies, uh, the, the uh, also the chips are getting smaller and they're getting faster. GPUs are getting faster, uh, which is much better where, where you can actually analyze the data on board and you can only bring down the data that you actually need. And this is very important, especially with hyperspectral data and, and uh, satellite radar uh, satellites that are generating um, more data than they can actually bring down. And then lastly, with image uh, optimization um, and data fusion, we've got many different types of satellites today. So there are satellites that have high resolution, but uh, are, have actually um, have uh, sort of like sparse um, kind of data, uh, uh, while there are also satellites that can uh, get the image much more frequently, but have lower resolution. And if you fuse them together, you of course uh, get a, a better and finer synthesized uh, image. And this uh, technique is, is being used today uh, now quite frequently. Um, and also not just with satellite data, but also fusing it with ground and aerial. 
So another um, um, area as well, we talked about uh, a lot on uh, satellite, the remote sensing and data analysis, but another trend uh, also today is basically uh, the space industry with, where it relates to human exploration um, and living in space. So um, today with the advent of commercial um, uh, spacecraft, you know, just like uh, Blue Origins, uh, uh, New Shepard and the uh, SpaceX's uh, Dragon, the kind of the, the traditional um, uh, function of a career astronaut is going away uh, because of automation. And so most of the, you know, Dragon and, and Blue Shepard, these are all automated uh, spacecraft uh, that today um, allows uh, space tourists to, be, to, to go up in space. Um, so that's kind of like one, one trend. The other thing as well is like today we only have the International Space Station, which is government owned, but there are now commercial sp stations like Axiom, Nanorax, and Blue Origin that are actually developing hardware. Um, and it's, we're now just a few years from having all of this uh, newer and sophisticated uh, like systems um, that are going to be put up, put up in space. And uh, so we're not at the how like 2000 or the tricorder um, kind of like era yet, but uh, also today um, AI doctors and assistants are being beta tested like on the International Space Station. And this is gonna be even be more critical um, as we have more non-career astronauts and, and space tourists that are also going up and uh, needing more uh, robotic um, assistance um, in space. So uh, the last section that I uh, wanted to talk about is uh, like we talked a lot uh, about the, the space activities kind of like within um, Earth orbit, uh, but the next kind of like the sort of like space 2.0 or, or maybe to even space 3.0 is beyond orbit, orbit uh, activities. So most of the time people would think, well, this is gonna be beyond kind of like our lifetime, but actually that is not the case. Again, because of exponential technologies uh, within this decade uh, from 2030 to, uh, to uh, 2030, uh, there's going to be a lot of NASA missions that are going uh, uh, for exploration um, in order to kind of like to set the stage um, for more uh, kind of like permanent uh, settlements uh, on the moon. And this is through the NASA CLIPS um, um, missions. And then uh, beyond that, there's going to be global commercial and other government activities on the surface of the moon. Um, and then, uh, and even beyond that, uh, is really more of the human settlements on moon, Mars, and, and beyond. So how do we actually get to that stage? Uh, one of the major things is that we need to kind of like lower the cost uh, and then also make sure uh, that the systems that we have are, are reusable. So it's interesting that um, even just, you know, less than five years ago, uh, reusable rockets were something that is the holy grail, like it's something that is um, at least in the rocket community is impossible. But today with SpaceX and Blue Origin, we're already seeing this happening uh, today. And this is kind of like a precursor to landing on other extraterrestrial bodies. Now, uh, the, the first thing to do, to do before landing um, uh, is actually to, to have uh, also permanent presence on orbit on the moon. So today we have the ISS that is orbiting around the earth. Uh, the next step is uh, stations orbiting on the moon. Um, and uh, no, this is again, this is no longer science fiction. The, the NASA Artemis program um, uh, as well is working on this and uh, hardware for the first parts um, of the station are already be being developed and it's called the, the NASA gateway. Um, and so the next thing is, is basically landing on the moon. Um, and I, as I mentioned, this has now been kind of uh, more jump-started by the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services or CLIPS. Um, about 10 years ago, there was the, Go the Google Lunar X Prize um, for commercial companies to start developing lunar landers. Um, and so uh, today, uh, some of those uh, companies are, are actually part of the 14 
uh, companies that have been contracted by NASA to uh, develop uh, some of this land, and some of them have already um, won the uh, the contracts. So I'm actually part of one of the the companies called Cirrus Robotics, um, who are vying to uh, actually develop and design landers and rovers uh, that will eventually um, uh, go to the moon. So. Uh, once we land, uh, I think really the bigger market is really what we do there uh, on the surface. And so therefore, kind of like the vision here uh, with surface operations is a lot of like robotic and, and automated um, either robotic missions to rovers that will be kind of like the bedrock and the stepping stones for actually creating all of the infrastructure um, that's going to be happening for creating either uh, you know, um, moon bases and, and moon posts um, on on the moon. But uh, it, kind of like even further to that really is that all we do on the moon right now, at, at least for SpaceX, uh, is sort of a practice run for landing on Mars and, and settling Mars. And as uh, I guess one press conference with NASA that just happened like recently, this was sort of like basically the case. The moon is going to be the, the practice run for all of the other um, the missions and settlements that's gonna happen either on Mars and, and kind of like and, and beyond. And my, my kind of like my last slide here is, is really, uh, this almost looks uh, again, more like science fiction, but at the, the same time, asteroid mining is actually something uh, that is uh, uh, in, in the minds of a lot of now companies being backed as well by uh, VCs and even uh, countries like Luxembourg who are now looking at um, you know, uh, extraterrestrial um, mining for resources as a, a big sort of like market for the future. Because uh, essentially, you know, we are living in a finite planet with finite resources. And so therefore kind of like our future um, is really to have to go out um, and explore, not just explore, but also uh, find resources. So I will leave you with uh, this uh, final uh, slide which is, uh, I like this, this quote, that the future is here. Uh, it's just not evenly distributed. Um, with exponential technologies, um, a lot has, has happened in the space industry. I actually think that we've finally reached sort of like that inflection point in that exponential curve for this particular industry. And um, I think that adjacent industries like AI, you know, robotics, computing, uh, 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 big data are going to play a big role um, for sure uh, in this uh, sort of very exciting, but also, um, you know, very rich market opportunity that's going to be happening within the, the next uh, few years and in, in decades to come. So again, thank you so much for um, for inviting me um, to, to give this talk. This is my, um, my contacts. So uh, website to um, my LinkedIn, and also I do a podcast as well uh, monthly on spacebase.buzzsprout.com. So again, um, uh, thank you, uh, Kiora, and uh, have a nice day. Uh, great conference. Mm -hmm.